People often think of agriculture as wide open rural spaces dotted with farmhouses and barns, large fields of hay and grain, and animals grazing. But along the highly urbanized Wasatch Front in northern Utah, there is a small but growing population of farmers who are creatively using precious plots of land to grow food, mostly to be sold directly to local consumers. For the next few minutes, we'll visit with a few urban farmers who are growing crops in and near cities and fueling the local food movement. We'll look at what they do, how they do it, and what it will take to keep them farming into the future. Members of the Roberts family have been farming the same land in Layton, Utah since 1850. Uh, I'm the, so I'm the sixth generation on the farm, still farming, multi-generational. My father still farms with me. 30 years ago, when Tyson Roberts was a boy, the family farmed more than 200 acres. A lot has changed in the family and the community in recent decades. As generations have passed, uh, grandmother passing away and land being divided up among other siblings. Also a lot of leased ground that has just basically been developed and lost uh, in that respect. So we, starting around over 200 acres, we're down to about 60 acres a year. Of that 60 acres, Roberts owns 18 acres which means two-thirds of the land they have under cultivation could be developed at any time. And uh, the rest of the ground is spread out between about three miles, three mile radius. So we're spread out, we're moving equipment uh, around a lot on the roads. In less than a generation, Layton City has gone from a farming community to a suburban city with large-scale residential developments going up every year. The day we interviewed Roberts, the old sod farm north of his greenhouses was just starting to be turned into a subdivision. A few weeks earlier, as we watched Roberts and his father prepare the tomato field for planting, the finishing touches were being put on a subdivision to the west of the same field. Farming in a rapidly growing urban area has drawbacks and benefits, Roberts says. Definitely more difficult to, to farm, uh, difficult moving equipment around a lot higher population, a lot more uh, risk as far as uh, people coming onto the farm, uh, creating damage uh, to the crops, uh, you know, just a lot of different changes. A lot of benefits as well. We've changed our farming operation from a, a mostly wholesale crops to, to retail, where we have the customers right in place. Robert sells at several farmers markets a week and right at the farm at a self-serve farm stand. Selling directly to the public means communicating with the public at farmers markets and through other means. So I use social media to share my farm story basically and also it's, it's turned into a good marketing tool. So I, I have a lot of friends on Facebook that I just keep up to date on when a certain crop is available, when the sweet corn comes on, when the tomatoes come on. People, there's, there's lots of customers out there and if they know that I've got tomatoes, they'll come to the farm. Roberts plans to keep farming the rest of his life and pass the legacy along to the seventh generation of Roberts family farmers. In Bountiful, Utah, less than 10 miles from downtown Salt Lake City, Ralph Larson still farms a small part of the ground where he's lived since he was 9 years old. Now, 75 years later, the original 20-acre farm is less than 2 acres. A lot of cherry orchards here and peach orchards, a lot of strawberries, cantaloupes, watermelons. Now we've got a little few raspberries and peach trees and a few apple trees, that's about it. We we're raising garlic this year, coming along pretty good. A few years ago, Larson wanted to continue farming, but be less involved in the business. 
so other family members got involved, and Larson Farms became Three Squares Produce Farms. They now manage the home property and leased fields. I just the Western Airport's a little farm down there, we're sort of leasing that, and then down on Alpine, Utah, they have some land down there we're leasing to raise some uh, potatoes and, and corn, squash, and some pumpkins maybe. Like many urban farms today, Three Square sells at farmers markets directly from the farm and to about 25 weekly customers who sign up for the season. Larson remembers when Bountiful was mostly made up of orchards and farms. Now his is one of the few remaining farms in the area. All the farms are pretty well gone nowadays. They replace them with houses. And it looks like our food's gonna have to come from overseas. We're not having any farms kept here anymore. Like the title of this family history book indicates, this small property is the last orchard on Orchard Drive. Larson said he has changed some things over the years. He no longer needs the bigger tractor, opting for a smaller garden tractor. He tries not to make too much dust or noise that may disturb the neighbors, and they switched exclusively to produce many years ago. Yeah, it, uh, you don't have any animals anymore. They sort of, uh, you had, I had horses and cows in that years ago, and as new people moved in, they didn't like the smell of animals, so he sort of had to get rid of them. And uh, all we got now is a dog. <laughs>
pointed out. The family owns about an acre of orchard and raised bed gardens a couple blocks away, right next to I-15. They also own about five acres north of the Salt Lake International Airport. Third piece of property is this one over here in North Salt Lake. It's the one that the greenhouse sits on, and, and uh, we work with uh, Three Squares Produce. And um, that one we have the corn on, we have the 2,200 square foot hoop house, and a 3,000 square foot heated greenhouse. Heated and cooled, I guess, in the summer greenhouse. Along with not knowing how long they will have access to the property they don't own, Tua Oni says the biggest challenge of urban farming is having crops spread out between locations. Going different places is definitely a, a big challenge. I've got three different places to, to uh, work. I've got my lettuce at three different spots, so anytime I want to harvest lettuce, and the problem is that I've got three varieties here, four varieties here, seven varieties here, and I want a nice, gorgeous spring mix. So I'm not going to just harvest from one spot. I will always harvest from all three places in order to make my spring blend. Tua One expects to keep farming for a long time to come. While this is her full-time profession, she isn't in it for the money. She is passionate about her work, and she wants to provide quality local produce for city residents. She has 25 weekly customers and sells at about six farmers markets. So my name is Sharon Leopardi and I run a urban farm called Backyard Urban Garden Farms, also known as Bug Farms. And I have um, 10 backyards across Salt Lake City and in Sandy that I use as my farmland. You won't find a lot of large farm equipment or loud noises at Sharon Leah Party's farm, as she, her employees, and work trade volunteers carefully cut microgreens and salad greens for her weekly customers. There is a peaceful feeling in the garden. It's a gentler kind of farming than takes place at larger farms. Leah Party is part of a growing number of younger urban farmers who don't own any land. They grow food in other people's backyards. There is a pretty growing movement of young people interested in agriculture probably for more alternative reasons, not so much because their families have been into it, but more because we've learned about the state of our food system in this country and are not happy with it and want to be a part of a change. And so that's my motivation for wanting to become a farmer is I wanted to see, be uh, involved with where my food comes from. In business since 2010, Bug Farms sells to restaurants and season-long customers. Her 145 community-supported agriculture shareholders pay at the beginning of the year for a season's worth of vegetables. Each week they receive a share of what's available that week. We focus on crops that, take, that don't take a lot of time and they also um, grow are pretty compact when they grow so we do lots and lots of different kinds of greens and root veggies including a bunch of different radishes and turnips and beets and carrots. Um, we do do a lot of tomatoes because people love them and um, cucumbers, summer squash and green beans. While Leah Party and her employees don't make a lot of money by many people's standards, they do okay and get to do what they love. They also don't have debt or large capital expenses. While things are going well this year, she knows that not owning any land makes her business vulnerable. Using other people's backyards is awesome because they don't have to pay for it, but it's also a drawback because it's not, it's not um, a stable place. Like They might decide the next year that they want to have their own garden, and so I've invested all of this time and effort in like amending the soil, putting in an irrigation system, um, and then it might have to go away um, the next year. To buy property, unless you already had another job doing something else and had a bunch of money already, like, it would be really, really difficult to buy land here. Yeah, property would be way too expensive. Leah Party and her fellow bug farmers are proving that small-scale urban agriculture can be an economically viable career option for people who are passionate about growing food and providing nutritious local food for a growing population.